not just in the greater Sydney area, but right across the state of New South Wales. You can expect to see high visibility policing right across the state. Yes, there will be a focus on those LGAs of concern, and that is about trying to stop the spread of the virus, particularly those people who are po positive uh, COVID moving around. Um, can I say that from my perspective, overnight we've seen nearly 500 infringements written for a range of health orders. 120 of those were people for not wearing masks and other were a mix of the health orders. And over the next 21 days, the New South Wales community need to know that we are out there enforcing these health orders to stop the spread of the virus so we can come out of lockdown. I don't apologise for that. We all want the same thing, but we need a circuit breaker from a law enforcement perspective. And that started at midnight last night. Thank you. Well, can I start by, of course, of passing on my condolences to those that have lost loved ones overnight with this recent outbreak. My updates for regional and rural New South Wales. Western New South Wales has touched on and the focus is Dubbo, uh, where we are really concerned, and Walgett. Uh, there were 35 cases overnight. That does remain a concern for our, our health network and those communities. And my message for those all in Dubbo, we know how interconnected those regions and those communities are, is to please follow the health orders, the stay home orders and try and minimise mobilisation. The Hunter New England has stabilised, even though with 16 cases uh, they were all either close contact or in isolation. The Central Coast only two cases. Uh, North, Coast, uh, uh, North Coast, Tamworth and Armidale, no new cases, which is a good sign uh, that in parts of the state we are on top of it, showing clearly uh, that the, the sharp lockdowns do work. Uh, sewerage surveillance, as uh, uh, Dr Chan touched on, are concerning in Burke Parks and Lennox Head. So again, for those communities, uh, be vigilant, uh, stay in front of it. If you have symptoms, of course, get tested. And again, the message for everybody in the regions, if we follow the rules, stay home um, and do the right thing, we can come out of this lockdown sooner. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the welcome. My name is Sarah Fletcher and I'm a nurse manager working as a part of Sydney Local Health District's screening and vaccination program. As we know, vaccinations are an essential way we can protect ourselves, our loved ones and the entire community from the effects of COVID-19. Vaccinations are available at New South Wales Health vaccination hubs, general practitioners and pharmacies. Your first step to access these is to use the eligibility checker available through the New South Wales government website. If you are eligible, you can book in at your nearest clinic. In Sydney Local Health District, we have also been running community pop-up clinics since late July. We have focused on the southwestern pocket of our district in suburbs such as Lakemba, Greenacre, Campsie and Riverwood, and other areas with vulnerable populations such as Glebe, Redfern and Waterloo. Our community pop-up clinics have been extremely successful because they remove the barriers to accessing a vaccine. Some people don't have phones or computers or Medicare cards. Some people don't have transport and many don't have English as a first language. With these pop-up clinics, we have the capacity to go to vulnerable communities rather than having them come to us. And we make it a very easy process. For example, Last week, we set up two overnight clinics on site at Sydney Markets for the night workers who would have found it challenging to attend the vaccination hubs during the day. We have worked hard to engage with community organisations such as the Lebanese Muslim Association and local GPs to build trust within our communities because people are more likely to come forward if their own community leaders are involved. We've also worked with trusted organisations such as the Exodus Foundation and Mission Australia to reach the homeless or those at risk of homelessness. Initially, we found that some people were hesitant about the AstraZeneca vaccine, but with the support of local trusted GPs and staff in our clinics providing information and education, they realised that AstraZeneca is safe and we've seen a real uptake since we started. So what happens when you come to one of our pop-up clinics? Firstly, vaccinations are free and you don't need a referral or a Medicare card. Just come along with your ID and if you are eligible, you can receive your vaccination then and there. 
When you get there, you'll be greeted by our staff and to guide you through to get your vaccine, we have a wonderful team of cultural support workers, interpreters and administrative support staff. Before your vaccination, you'll be asked some simple health questions and you'll be provided with information about the vaccine. And you'll always have the opportunity to ask any questions before you go any further. The vaccine itself is very quick to administer. Once you roll up your sleeve, it takes seconds and our amazing vaccination staff will make the process as comfortable for you as possible. Once you have had your vaccine, you will wait for a short time in an observation area in our care so we can make sure you are well immediately after getting your vaccine. And once you have been given the all clear from our staff, you are good to go. It is important to recognise that depending on daily demand, there, will, there may be a wait to receive your vaccine when you do come to one of the pop-ups. We do really appreciate your patience with this as we work hard to get everyone vaccinated safely. Since July 28, we have administered over 7,500 vaccinations across our Sydney Local Health District community pop-up sites. This is a phenomenal response from the community and we look forward to seeing even more people come along. It has been extraordinary to see everyone come through and we are definitely seeing momentum building. More and more people are coming along to every clinic that we hold and it's so encouraging to see that people are keen to be a part of the change. All in all, the response has been outstanding and we look forward to continue collaborating with communities as a part of this vaccination effort. Now, just a reminder, to access vaccinations more broadly, head to the eligi eligibility checker first. It's available on the New South Wales government website and if you can make a booking there, please do so as soon as you can. Thank you. Oh, um, I'm not sure um, how often you've been listening to my uh, to my uh, messages, uh, but I've been uh, announcing the tragic deaths every single day, and every single. And I think I've repeated on a number of occasions that whilst uh, for privacy reasons we only give the age group and the circumstances that every death is a person who has loved ones who has died in tragic circumstances and our heartfelt condolences uh, to all of those loved ones and families. And we say to everybody in New South Wales, we want to see a reduction in the number of families suffering. We want to see a reduction in the number of, number of deaths we have to announce. And for those reasons, we're asking people not to cut corners, not to go visit extended family members, uh, to exhibit every measure of caution. You shouldn't be leaving the house unless you absolutely have to. We know there's a group of workers that have to leave those concerning areas in particular, and that's why we're making a priority to vaccinate them, to make sure that they don't unintentionally spread the virus, get the virus, and then take it home to their families. And this is why it's so critical for us to make sure we get the message. Uh, unfortunately, we know that some in the community don't take this seriously enough. They don't think it's a serious illness. But as Dr Champ, myself and the ministers have said every day, it is a horrible disease with horrible consequences. Uh, infectious, the Delta strain has an infectiousness to it like we've never seen before. And we've seen similar populations to New South Wales around the world have thousands and thousands of cases reported every day. Now, we don't, we don't want to get to that in New South Wales. We want to make sure the case numbers come down and not up. And that's why we want to make sure that people not only understand how serious this is, understand the rules, but please follow them. Don't think it doesn't apply to you. You might think you're going to be OK, but think about your loved ones who may not be OK. And unfortunately, we see that in some circumstances it has randomly caused death in younger people. And we know in New South Wales, 70 per cent of cases are people under the age of 40. That's why we're focusing our vaccinations on 16 to 39 year olds in the next few weeks, in particular in those areas of concern. But everybody who has access to a vaccine, doesn't matter where you live or what your age, you should come forward and just get vaccinated. Well, I wish I knew that and I wish Dr Chant knew that, but we will see the numbers come down when people stay home and people don't move about unless they absolutely have to. And until we see that, uh, we're not going to see the case numbers go down. Unfortunately, it only takes, as we said, a handful of people to do the wrong thing. And every day through Crime Stoppers or through direct involvement, 
the New South Wales Police Force has dozens of examples of people who are flagrantly just disobeying the rules. And you can't, you can't have that happen. You can't have that happen uh, when there's such a serious, serious disease. Uh, can I please make this point very clear? Uh, when we uh, announced, um, announced the various uh, up health updates at 11 o'clock on, on Saturday, uh, we went immediately upstairs and Dr Chant advised me that there are additional local government areas of concern. Uh, we consulted the Deputy Premier, of course, and our other colleagues, and it was apparent to us there's a precaution. There would have only been a, few, a handful of local government areas that weren't affected in regional New South Wales. And, and, and it's important for us to make sure we get the message out as quickly as possible. There were various channels where the communication was made through community leaders. Uh, and we have to appreciate that there are so many communities in regional New South Wales that rely on their local networks, their local leaders, their local information, their local health districts to get the message out. And all of those channels were used. I think it's apparent that everybody knows the serious situation we're in. And I think people also know that uh, when we need to take immediate and decisive action, we will. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is. It doesn't matter what day it is. Uh, we take advice from our health officials and we always act on that immediately. Yes. So, so what we want to do is make sure that there's no delay between, like clearly the case numbers are putting a lot of stress on our public health contact tracing um, systems. We are scaling and we are using, um, reviewing all our processes to look at how we can streamline those. So let's just be very clear, these escalating case numbers are a real challenge. We are working, so what we've instituted is a system where people will receive a text message um, when the report, when the um, automated um, positives are uploaded to our system from the laboratories. Now this means that there is no delay if someone perhaps doesn't answer their uh, phone or other things, they'll at least have the text message there. Um, and what we will do is it contains information on what you need to do as a, a case, what you need to immediately ask your household to be isolating and also requesting that, um, providing some details of how you can contact us. And we've got an on, on board call centre for that. And also we will then follow up with an interview um, as soon as possible. So this was considered an innovation um, to actually decrease the time it takes for someone to get a positive result. And we're conscious that the turnaround times in some of our laboratories is also stretched out. So we just want to make sure we're getting to people as soon as possible. A lot of the people will be just people going about your business. So if you don't actually think you've got COVID um, and you've been out um, about, remember we have the, consider people are infectious for a couple of days before they have symptom onset. So if I get a test today because I've got symptoms, I'm still potentially infectious for the two days before. So obviously people will be infectious in the community. But what we're, the purpose of us saying to act as if you are COVID positive when you're out and about, or assuming everyone else is COVID positive, is we're hoping that even if you have been out and about, you're minimised, you've only been out there to get the bottle of milk, to get the groceries. You've done it in a, you've had your mask properly fitted. You've done your QR check-in. You've been very quick. You've kept your distance. You're 1.5 metres away from people. And if that's the case, you have a very, very extremely low chance of ever passing on COVID. And so that breaks the chain of, infection. That's why even when you're out and about, we're asking you to take those precautions so that even if we have people 
infectious in the community, their activities are low risk. So if you've been infectious in the community and have only gone to a takeaway coffee shop, not come in contact, you know, sort of click and collect, then yes, you've been out infectious in the community, but your risk of having transmitted to anyone is very low. And that's why that message has to be um, conveyed to the community and adopted. That's correct. So the lockdown has absolutely worked. If we did not have the restrictions on our movements, we would have seen escalating case numbers. I think like all things, there's multiple factors that why we haven't achieved the success to date. Um, and I think it's um, the fact that a lot of initiatives have been now put in place to address those barriers. It's pleasing to see. Um, so some of the issues is I think we've communicated better to the community about um, the fact that people can be out and about and infectious without symptoms. I think that took a while for the community to understand. I think that also um, we have had some compliance issues and it, it's um, the work we've been working ha hand and glove with police, but I think the increased um, compliance activities will assist us. Can I say most people are doing the right thing, but it is a small proportion of people that um, can put jeopardise um, this outcome. Um, I don't think that there's a disparate message. I think that clearly we have to, from my perspective, we have to get case numbers down. This level of case numbers is not where we want to be, where we need to be. And I and my team and as far as the government is committed to doing everything we can to drive these case numbers down. Um, but I think, but I think the issue, but I think the issue is that vaccination, in the end, COVID will exist in in um, the world. We will never eliminate COVID from the world. We know we have the privilege now of having a vaccine, and my comments yesterday were clear. I do not see vaccination as a silver bullet. Um, we have to work hard to get those levels up. And even when we have those high vaccine coverage, we will still have to um, move around in society in a way acknowledging the threat of COVID. But we will hopefully have incredibly, this is into the future, incredibly low levels of transmission. And we will have- Um, look, can I just say the thing that gives me joy every day is looking at the vaccine coverage data. Um, that's uploaded on the Commonwealth website at three, around 2 or 3 p.m. every day. And can I say a big call out to the community? It has been amazing. We have been lifting our vaccine coverage rate somewhere in the order of, I think, about 7%. 7 per, 7 per, 7 per cent. Um, this injection of the vaccine will again lift our first dose. Now we have to get our second dose up. And I'm, you know, the thing that distresses me is if you go to that website, you'll see it broken down by various age groups. And it distresses me that the 70 plus second dose is still um, from memory only around 40 to 50, you know, 50%. So we really need to get our second dose up as well as our first dose. But we now have so many channels for accessing vaccines. Um, we have pharmacies rolling out vaccines. Um, we have GPs working so hard. GPs, even on Saturday, gave record volumes of vaccine. So vaccination is part of the solution. And I want to see those vaccine coverage rates get up as high as possible. But similarly, we have to follow the public health orders and stay at home because we can't have escalating case numbers in the presence of vaccine. In the end, the vaccine and getting that vaccine coverage will help us. But we know we need to get very high levels of coverage as quickly as we can. And we are very privileged 
that we have the tools available. The government has also put in a range of welfare supports and incentives um, like isolation payments and other initiatives. So really um, that welfare focus means there should not be any barriers to people um, effectively isolating and know that the that there are a lot of community. I just want to reassure the community that there are community sports available if you're struggling um, and you need help. There is mechanisms to provide that help. Um, so, in terms of the turnaround time, we're looking at a range of strategies to, to um, reduce those turnaround times and working closely with the private pathology labs. Can I just indicate that those turnaround times are not significant, are not evenly distributed across um, providers. So I think it is really important to not give a message that everyone will take five days to get a test. And also, we have got rapid testing facilities that we use for the high risk close contacts. So we have got a mechanism that people don't wait for those. Um, but in terms of other strategies, we are looking at rapid antigen testing, and we've certainly had strong industry engagement promoting the use of rapid antigen testing. So if we can move some of our testing to using other um, non-PCR-based testing methods, that will actually free up our capacity to do, get those turnaround times down. New South Wales Health takes the health and safety of its workers with the utmost priority. Uh, and a large proportion of the staff have been vaccinated. There is intense um, PPE requirements and personal protective requirements. So I'd be confident that the CE of that district will be putting all measures in place to protect patients and staff. And can I just reassure people the emergency department is open. Again, the last thing we wanted to see is any urgent care compromised by people's concerns. Well, firstly, I mean, we've made a decision about a permit system for the Greater Sydney for uh, access to the regions, and we'll have a limited list of reasons why you can go. Uh, there have been many examples of, of people who have left Sydney to, to go and tender, say, a second residence. Uh, we'll be limiting that to one person only. There are a number of changes that we'll make, but we'll make that clear this week. We're working with the Commissioner. The permit system will be up this weekend. Uh, and now that we're in lockdown, it does give us a period of cover in the region. So this is timely. I mean, these things don't don't come about easy, but it's a system that I'm confident with the extra surveillance also and the resources on the roads outside of Sydney and into those areas like Dubbo, I'm confident that we'll get on top of this in a very different way. I'll, I'll continue here. I'll just continue here. Yeah, no, no. Look, to make it clear, because we know in the regional rural New South Wales, uh, and I come from the regions, you can't go to your grocery store just five k's down the road. In many, many cases, it's, it's longer than that. So within a local government area, you are permitted to, to move about to get your shopping, your groceries. Uh, we want you to minimise that movement, but, but of course we know it's more than five k's. So there's no distance rule within an LGA. But if you're bordering on the edge of an LGA and you've got to go to the neighbouring LGA to go grocery shopping, of course there's no limit if that's the only option you have. It says that in the exemption within the rules. But we want to limit people from ex going into other LGAs as much as we possibly can, especially for exercise. There's no reason that you should be leaving an LGA in regional rural New South Wales for exercise. So those exemptions are there. The flexibility is there, understanding the very different arrangements and the tyranny of distance in regional and rural New South Wales.
Okay, so you know, firstly, I've, I've welcomed the Upper House inquiry because it gives us an opportunity to look at the focus on regional rural health, especially around service delivery. But our track record and investment in regional and rural health, when you look at the upgrade of existing hospitals or new hospitals, uh, there's no time in the history of this state have we seen that level of investment. But there are issues on the ground, and that's what the Upper House inquiry will focus on. And we've had these conversations internally. We'll wait for that inquiry. But am I confident enough that we can manage the health system? in the regional and rural New South Wales? Of course we can. You have, have a look at what we, what, what we did overnight with Walgett, the ability to, to readdress and um, redirect resources into Walgett. The Royal Flying Doctors going into Wilcannia on Saturday, 320 vaccine shots on, on Saturday and staying there for a couple of days. So we have a, a network in the regions that work together in the resources, but part of the lockdown is also precautionary that we don't overwhelm the health system in regional and rural New South Wales. And that's why the lockdown was important, so we don't overwhelm the health system, but I am confident in the health system and the arrangements we've got in the regions in dealing with outbreaks, dealing with, of course, testing and, of course, vaccination, keeping up with Sydney. Minister, the vaccination and the Queensland, there's a lot of issues in the Queen's areas. Is there anything being worked through there or even perhaps even redrawing the line while... Well, in the past, down at Albury, Wodonga, Queenby and Canberra, uh, and then Tweed and the Gold Coast, we've had uh, bubbles in the past, border bubbles. Again, the cross-border commissioner James McTavish is working towards that. We work with our counterparts across uh, the, the borders. This is tough for border communities. We know the impact because you do rely heavily often on the other side of the border, and that's both ways. But the reality is we have a cross-border commissioner. We've done this all before, and we'll work through those issues. Thank you. I'll ask, I'll ask the police commissioner to um, address this issue, but obviously all of those issues are considered and canvassed and police have given us their advice on what we must do uh, to reduce uh, people doing the wrong thing. And can I say, it comes down to us. Uh, no matter what rules are in place, if people are choosing to ignore them, we will continue to be in serious trouble. Can I stress the case numbers are disturbingly high and we are, as Dr Chan said yesterday, at a fork in the road. Do we want these case numbers to come down or are we going to live in fear and have case numbers continue to go up? Now that is up to all of us together and as we say every day, we know that the vast, vast majority of people are not only doing the right thing, but they're proactively protecting their loved ones by coming forward and getting vaccinated and encouraging their loved ones to get vaccinated as well as staying home. And it's so hard. Uh, all of us know how hard it is to not see your loved ones and not do the things that we're used to doing. But I say to those small number of people, small proportion in the community, do not continue to break the rules because it will continue to have tragic consequences. It will continue to cause distress. Having said that, we also know how important it is to vaccinate 16 to 39 year olds who previously did not have access to vaccines. When I say previously, prior to this outbreak. It's so important for us to get to that demographic. 70% of cases in New South Wales are people aged between 16 to 39, and in particular in those local government areas of concern. And that is why we must ensure that we provide that opportunity. But I do want Commissioner Fuller to also address those policing issues as he has considered them all in relation to police operations. And uh, we need to let police do what they do best. But I will ask Commissioner Fuller to talk about those operational issues. Yeah, thanks, Premier. Um, in terms of the New South Wales Police Force and the emergency management response with the Australian Defence Force, there are two key things we're focusing on. Firstly, is enforcing the health orders, including the additional powers that we asked for last week. That's the permits to country New South Wales, uh, a system to manage the bubble, the, the, the reality that some people are lying to contact traces, the reality that some people who are positives are staying out in the community. The second part of that is for police and defence to support the contact tracing supercharge that. So things like the strategies that Dr Chan spoke about, the electronic messaging that's instant that comes to us that also allows police to door knock, not just to let that person know that they are positive, but other people who live in the home. So there are two parts to it. There are the health orders that we have asked for that we are going to enforce very strictly over the next 21 days. It's defence and police assisting health to supercharge the contact tracing, which has been one of the saviours for us up until Delta. 
That's the two key focuses for police, defence, assisting health over the next 21 days. And as I said on Saturday, I won't be asking for any additional police or health orders at the moment because we need to give this strategy a chance. Every strategy takes seven to 14 days, whether it's a police strategy or a health strategy, to see what impact that has on the COVID numbers. Now, at the end of the 21 days, of course, as I have on many occasions, I would go back to the Premier and or Cabinet crisis to ask for what I think we need to assist. Certainly ask police officers to go hard, not in those terms. We were issuing probably four cautions for every ticket leading up to the Delta variants, which I think is great community-based policing, but it reaches a point sometime where you say people just aren't getting this. So in fairness, I've asked officers to certainly be active in terms of taking strong action. They still have the power of discretion. What I've asked them to do is what they should be doing anyway, which is recording the reason why they take action or they don't take action. So that's 300 I asked for three weeks ago, plus the 500 additional that come online from today. And that's in addition to the over 150 that are helping with hotel quarantine. So the LGAs of sorry. So anywhere that's an LGA of concern, we've deemed that recreation being unnecessary risk. We've left exercise in because it's much easier for police to work through that. Recreation is extremely broad, as we know. I think we can do without people sunbaking in the middle of a pandemic in an LGA of concern, but certainly recreation in those areas within your own LGA is still accepted if you're not in an LGA of concern. Thank you. Uh, if you even look at the Doty report in, the, in relation to uh, COVID, it says strong suppression because I think we all accept there's never been a complete elimination strategy because we know that so long as Delta or so long as COVID exists around the world, so long as we know Australians are coming back home, uh, there will be cases, there will be outbreaks. So the question is, how do we live with it? I would love to have a situation where we had zero cases of community transmission. I mean, of course we strive to get close to that as possible. And I'm, in fact, even since day one of this outbreak, we've said we want to get as close to having no infectious people in the community as possible. We've said we want to get as close to that number as possible. And that is exactly what we're striving for. Let me make that very clear. But can we pretend that there will always be zero cases of Delta in Australia? I don't think that is a realistic proposition. What is realistic is trying to get the number of infectious people in the community as close down to zero as possible. Now, that is always our intent. But we also have to accept we're not going to wipe this out. We're not going to have a situation where across Australia, whether it's in the quarantine system or elsewhere, that we're not going to have zero cases. I think, and, 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 and can I just say, can I make this point? No, excuse me, can I finish? Can I make this point? Uh, what I have just said is no different to what we've said uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's no different from what we've said to the start of the pandemic. We have to, whilst, globe, whilst COVID is active globally and whilst the Delta strain is causing carnage all around the world, we can't pretend we will get to zero and stay at zero forever. Even when you follow the Doty report to the nth degree, after you have 80% of double doses and you open up to an extent, depending on your case numbers, you open up, you're still at risk and you will see cases pop up. But obviously when you have 80% of your population vaccinated, that reduces the number of people that will end up in hospital and the number of people that will die. So let me make this very, very clear, which I've said from day one. It's always our aspiration and we have to work hard to get these case numbers down. It is not a, it is not a 
pleasant, pleasant is the wrong word to use, but it's not a situation that rests comfortably with anybody, quite the opposite. It's a horrible situation. We need to turn that around. But can I make this point? To suggest that we're going to have zero the whole way through until the pandemic ends across the world is, I don't think, a realistic proposition. Even the Doty report talks about strong suppression. Even when you get to 80%, it's about strong suppression. It's about reducing uh, the numbers as close to zero as possible in terms of people infectious in the community. That always has to be our aspiration. Now, we have to work really, really hard to get to that. But we also have to be real. Delta is, is with us. And even when you get to 80% double doses, you have to manage it. You have to learn to how to live with it without having major outbreaks. And our aim, as it has always been in the pandemic, is to keep people out of hospital, to keep people alive and safe, but to also make sure that we can live as freely as possible. And the chance we have to do that is with those higher vaccination rates. But also, can I say, we desperately need to reduce the case numbers. And we've been clear about that from day one. Uh, the comments I made yesterday weren't a big revelation. They're things we've been saying for months and months. And if other premiers, if other premiers, because at the end of the day, we know that we can't have society living the way we are now forever. So the way out of this is high vaccination rates and lower case numbers. And we've been saying that from day one and our aspiration to have less, you know, as close to zero as possible in terms of infectious people in the community remains what we want to achieve. I want to make that very clear. But to suggest that we'll have zero all the time across Australia with Delta uh, is, is, a, is, is something people talk about. But we also have to be real. Whenever you're welcoming home Australians, uh, the, the likely strain that they're going to have is Delta. So whether it's in the quarantine system or elsewhere, we're likely to see cases pop up. And even, even other states who are grappling with a handful of cases know how stubborn this thing is. Uh, even, even states that have locked down are still getting a handful of cases and it's really stubborn. But we need to desperately, we need to get the number down. And, and we've been clear about this from day one and people at home get it. We need to reduce case numbers and we need to, we need to keep, get those vaccination rates up to protect people and prevent them from going into hospital. Well, obviously, there's no exact science to what close to zero is, but it would depend on where is it occurring. Is it controlled? Is it linked back to the cases? And if you find the way all states and all nations report on their cases, uh, in fact, in Australia, we're fortunate in that we're still in a position to be able to report on the cases we have in isolation versus those that aren't in isolation. But uh, let me be clear that uh, in other states where the, vir where the virus is present, uh, all state leaders are talking about the numbers infectious in the community because we know that's what is concerning. When people are isolating and they get it, as tragic as it is, we know that at least they haven't infected other people during the course of their infectious period. And what worries us, what worries us, and, uh, and as we've said, our aspiration is always to get as close to that zero number as possible. But when we get to 70% double dose or 80% double dose, we'll take advice from Dr Chant, depending on where the case numbers are at, as to what freedoms we have at those stages. And I want to be very clear about this. Uh, we can't afford to live the way we are forever. So we have to have a roadmap out. And our roadmap out is compliance, making sure people do the right thing and stick to, to the rules. And secondly, is to protect the community through higher rates of vaccination. We know, we know, we know that both those things work. Excuse me, can I just have everybody ask me one at a time? Oh, well, certainly if we think there is a need to do that, of course we will. And uh, we want to do every measure we can to support communities on the ground so that they are in a position to make sure uh, that they're able to follow all the health orders uh, to the letter of the law. And that means supporting communities as we've done uh, in various parts of Greater Sydney. Of course, we'll do that to the regions. And I just want to make this point that when the Treasurer, the Deputy Premier and myself and the Crisis Cabinet were considering the financial support package, we didn't just include it to the areas of concern. 
concern, our financial support package extends to all of New South Wales because no matter where you're living, if you're a business who's ex experiencing hardship, you can apply for our business grants. If you're an individual who's lost their job or had reduction in hours, you can go to the disaster payments. We've also got direct payments, of course, uh, to, uh, to people who uh, might be at risk of uh, not isolating when they should be, and of course we'll extend that to the regions. Uh, that's a no-brainer for us. We're throwing everything at making sure people have the support they need to get through this, but also they have the support they need to follow the rules. We can't afford to have even one or two people, imagine one or two people in a country town going about and not uh, obeying the rules. That will then quickly get to 20 or 30 cases. So we know the risk, and that's why we're really stressing to everybody, don't be that one person that keeps the lockdown longer than it has to be. Don't be that one person that unintentionally causes distress to family and loved ones. Don't be that person. Is it your understanding of the Delta report that where we are now, we can still live more freely with the virus when we get to 70% double dose or 80% double dose uh, vaccination rate? Uh, can we still live more freely after that point? Or because case numbers are so high, do we need those cases? Yeah. Even, even if you get to 80% double doses, if the case numbers are very high, it does limit what you can do. No, that is, if you read the Doherty report, the Doherty report is based on the premise of 30 to 40 cases in relation to all the things you can do. So let's not confuse the two issues. You can live life more freely than what you are today. But the extent of your freedom depends on the case numbers. If case numbers are where they are now and we get to 80 per cent double doses, we won't be able to do everything that we want to do. Yeah, can I just make this very clear? There is a difference between a lockdown and restrictions. We will need to live with restrictions so long as Delta is around. So long as Delta has presence in the world, even when you get, even if we had zero cases and we were at 80 per cent double dose, you would still have to respect some rules that exist around vaccinations, around social distancing, around mask wearing. So long as Delta and deadly COVID is around, we will always need to live with a measure of restriction. But what we can do at every point is also determined by the case numbers. Will life be different when you have 80 per cent double dose of your community uh, vaccinated? It will be different, but the extent to which it will be different depends on the case numbers. If you have 500 cases a day at 80 per cent, that is still dangerous just to say, let it rip. You can't let it rip. I'm sorry. Well, I'll ask uh, Dr Chant to comment on that point, given she um, obviously gets the reports daily. But this is why we asked everybody from those concerning uh, hotspots to make sure they get vaccinated before they get back to work. Because uh, we know that there's critical work that needs to be done, but we also know that to protect the community, uh, we need to make sure those jabs are in arms. But in relation to uh, transmissibility, Dr Chant's advice always is reduce mobility. Do not leave the house unless you absolutely have to. But of course, we know that even if you're vaccinated, but a large proportion of the community isn't vaccinated, you can still risk getting the vaccine, uh, getting the virus and passing it on, but obviously to a lesser extent. But we need to understand the best way to reduce case numbers is to reduce our mobility. Only move around if you absolutely have to. And uh, in, of course, uh, set in the context of those vaccination rates. And the higher the vaccination rates, the more options we have. But the higher vaccination rates have to be done in tandem with reducing case numbers. Because imagine, even if you get to 80% double doses, it does give you more options, but it still means if, you, if your case numbers are too high, you can't live as freely as you would like. And that is why the two things are critical. We've always said lockdown and vaccination. We know vaccination helps reduce the spread. It helps bring case numbers down, but it also protects people. But lockdown uh, obviously restricts movement. It restricts the virus spreading the, the rate it would have. We would have had thousands of cases today. I mean, Florida has a population of 21 million and they've got 150,000 cases a day. I'm sorry?
Uh, well, obviously, um, obviously we, we call upon people to reduce their mobility, but any allowable work within those LGAs of concern uh, would always be contactless. We can't have people in contact with one another. That is, that is, that they are the concern. So obviously, government is speaking to stakeholders about what is a safe thing to do uh, as we are working our way through the lockdown. Last question. Last, last question. Well, we absolutely could if people keep ignoring the rules. And, and it is a combination of things that will turn things around. The most important thing is for people to stay at home. Don't leave home unless you have to. It is very frustrating every day when we get examples of a handful of people doing the wrong thing, having parties or having gatherings they shouldn't be having. Or, or leaving the house when they've got symptoms and they haven't been tested. It's horrible hearing those examples every day. They're not a lot of examples, but only four or five across the population causes enormous grief. So that's why the police operations have been substantially enhanced. We have 500 extra ADF on the ground from today. And secondly, is to, to prevent uh, hospitalisation and death through those higher vaccination rates and also to reduce the spread. Thank you, everybody.